Good afternoon, or should I say good day? How many Australians do we have? Wow, this looks like in Sydney. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. This is really a privilege, it's both privilege and, and a great pleasure to join the, uh, join the conference here. And, uh, you know, the English or Australian is not my first language. Uh, so maybe you should ask a question. <laughs> Would you prefer English or Finnish this afternoon? Yeah, there are some people who say that it doesn't really make any difference to me. <laughs> so great, uh, uh, great to be here. If you um, if you want to take a look at the what follows, I'm going to show you some slides. The, the easiest thing probably is to to uh, join me in social media, Twitter, and I'm going to post this. Uh, slide deck for you in the afternoon, so you can go back if there's anything that you uh, you would like to take a look at a, again. I was really uh, taken by what Lee, is Lee with us here? What Lee was saying in the morning, I, I think you, um, I was really kind of a standing humble before your words and, and wisdom, and, and one of those things that you said very, you put it in a very elegantly, you remember you saw the picture of the lake and you said that it's very difficult to say anything about there's such a thing as a lake unless you take a kind of a multiple angle perspective. And I was thinking that this is exactly what I try to do here this afternoon, is to, um, to try to look at the, the teacher education in one particular place. Uh, that is the place that I probably know the best uh, until now before moving to Australia. But I, I try to provide you kind of a picture of what does the, um, the teacher education in, in Finland mean to the rest of the world? Uh, and there are two things, of course. The one is that we can use it uh, appropriately. So we can really try to understand and make sense out of you know, what has happened in one country, uh, in this case Finland. Or we can misuse it. We, we can kind of adopt ideas that are not true. Um, and those are both important. I'm probably going to spend a little bit more time with the myths because that's a kind of a risky, a very risky and dangerous thing to do in education is to rely on something that you think is true but is not. And I can tell you one thing that there are many things, probably most of the things that you have heard about Finnish education are not true. That's the kind of a thing. It's, it's very hard to understand. Even I have my colleagues from, uh, from uh, Finnish universities here and it's the same thing. That's very hard and difficult to really understand properly what's going on in a complex system like education. So I'll speak a little bit about that and try to um, kind of bring a summary to this. But before we uh, do anything else, I would like to recognize all the women in the room because today is the International Women's Day. And, um, and I would invite all of my male brothers here in the room, and if anybody is following in the, uh, online, um, to join me in pressing even harder for progress. I think we have done a lot for making this world equally good place for women, our sisters to live, but we haven't certainly done enough. So that today is the day to remember and recognize and remind all of us that we, we need to work harder to make sure, particularly in this profession that we are talking about, teaching and teacher education, that we respect and value uh, everybody in, in the field the same way. If you ask my opinion, I think every day of the year should be an International Women's Day um, and inter International Men's Day and Children's Day. But it's a good that we have this one day when we stop and think and, and ask ourselves what have we done and what needs to be uh, done to do that. The second thing I would like to uh, recognize here is this happy birthday of this wonderful program. And I wouldn't have done this otherwise, but since Andy Hargreaves, who's a, my brother uh, from the different mother, <laughs> and a good friend here, insisted me that we had to sing. How about that? Would you like to sing with me? Yeah. Why not? So let's, uh, let's sing Happy Birthday, everybody knows this song, to just let's say Hong Kong, okay? Because this is where we are. And let's see how we feel after that. Happy birthday, Hong Kong you. Happy birthday, Hong Kong you is a proposal, and I think we can accept that one, right? So, are you ready to sing? Yes. No, I mean, are you ready to sing with me? Yes. Okay, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Louder. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Tilkon you. Happy birthday to you. So that's it. Any questions? All right. Okay. Now, let me uh, let me stop here just for a moment. Let's let's assume that we were here in year 2000. Okay, so that's 18 years ago. And this uh, university, obviously, and this program was well in the way towards the 100th anniversary in year 2000. But my question to you would be that if you look around the room 18 years ago here, and if you look at the program, the keynote speakers and, and panelists and those things that were said, you would probably see very different people from very different parts of the world coming here. Certainly there would be not a delegation from Finland, as you see sitting over there and here. Uh, there would be probably people from Sweden and Norway instead, our neighbors. Um, there wouldn't be probably too, many, too much attention to Singapore or Canada, because the world was very different that time. 18 years ago, the, the geography of the landscape of global education was very different. If you were in the business of asking, where should I go to learn good ideas about systems improvement, improving the whole education system or teacher education system, nobody, very few people would come to Finland. Actually, Finland didn't exist in, in 2000 yet. <laughs> very few people thought that we have an education system in Finland because that was the case. So I'm trying to make a point here that something has happened fairly recently that has changed many things, how we think about education, teacher education, and particularly globally when we try to make sense of what's going on. So, of course, if this was year 2000, many of you, probably most of us here in this room, would know that something will be done this year that will be maybe interesting and bring some evidence, some proof of what we thought we knew in year 2000 about good systems of education and good practices around the world. And most of us would have probably heard about the OECD PISA study. Raise your hand if you know what OECD PISA is. Most people do. You know, sometimes in the conferences like this, and I thank you very much for the introduction, that you didn't introduce me as PISA solver. <laughs> I, they often do that because they think that if you're from Finland, everybody in Finland should be called PISA. But well, I'm not. Okay. So we knew that you know, this, is a, this is a year when the data will be collected, and next year, those who were more educated, aware about what's going on with the OECD, most of you would know that uh, the results will come only next year. And now when you go and have a lunch or coffee from a conference like this, there will be a lot of speculation about who will be the winners, who will do very well in this new OECD study that nobody has ever seen before. And guess who were the candidates to win? France, of course. England, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. And then Sweden and Norway. And there's one country that was not in any of those lists of predicted winners, and that's Finland. And I remember that just like my colleagues over here. The spring, uh, the, the fall 2001, when we were waiting for the results for the first time, we were a little bit like, concern about what's going to happen. How do we explain this, this thing that we are not really doing that well? But then we kind of had an excuse. We said, we have no expectations whatsoever in the PISA study, except one. And that's that we want to be better than Sweden. <laughs> but other than that, you know, nothing really matters. And that made life much more easier. You know, if you set your target to the top and you're not there, it's a, it's a bad thing to do. So, this is what the world saw in December 2001. And, and my presentation is not really about the piece, but I just tried to make my point what this has done to the community like ours this year, or the global conversation about education and educational improvement. You see there's Finland, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Ireland, and South Korea in the first year 2000 reading literacy part of the OECD piece. <laughs> And again, I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about this with my colleagues over there, but I remember working at the University of Helsinki at that time when my phone started to ring in the morning when the news came out. And people were asking that, so how do we explain this now? 
And I said, well, my answer was, I have no idea. Because we never thought about it like this. And, and then we concluded kind of quietly in Finland that let's do nothing. And maybe the OECD made a mistake. <laughs> maybe they kind of mismeasured Finland and we should be somewhere there where Sweden and Norway and Denmark and others are. The only thing that made us really celebrate in Finland was that the Sweden was number nine. <laughs> are there any Swedish people still in the room? <laughs> So a couple of people leaving. <laughs> so we didn't do really too much, and, and we didn't believe that this, this, this is a kind of a real picture of what the Finnish school system uh, from this perspective does. So we said, let's wait for three years and see what OECD comes about three years later. And this is a mathematics. You see Finland, South Korea, Netherlands, Japan, Canada, and Belgium. And again, uh, there, there were many people in my country who said, maybe the OECD made the same mistake twice. So let's not do too much. If you look at the number of uh, journal papers and articles published after the first study by the Finns, there's, there's nothing there. Really. There are very few public uh, appearances or keynotes or anything immediately after the first study. Uh, so we said that you know, this, we, we cannot really understand how to explain this, particularly when it came to mathematics. So again, the Finns said, that let's wait another three years. Uh, because we knew that the OECD would come put this out, sign your study three years later and see what's there. And we saw something like this in uh, December 2007, Finland, Canada, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Netherlands, and so on. And my point, uh, and this is, a, this is a conclusion by many others who have been researching this international scheme, uh, scene, like Andy Hargreaves and Dennis Shirley and Michael Fuller and many others, who have been really looking at the global thing, what has happened here, is that then we have to really conclude something. And this conclusion was that something has changed. The things are not as they used to be. That there are now new education systems that seem to be doing things, not only the, that they're doing things better, but they're doing things very differently. And it's only then after this third study, when people started in a kind of a more serious uh, way, look at study Finland and other countries to see, you know, how can we explain, you know, what has been going on there. And that's the end of my PISA story. Are you with me until now? Is anybody sleeping? Because if, if somebody's sleeping, we can sing a little bit more. We can do that anyway. So, but, you know, there are a couple of things related to the teaching profession and teacher education issues that directly comes from the OECD work, primarily IRP. And one of them is the International Summit for the Teaching Profession that will meet again a couple of, couple of weeks from now in Lisbon, Portugal. And this has been something that has happened every year since year 2011. And, and this is the OECD Education International-led Global Summit where the condition of participation is that you have to do very well in PISA and your delegation has to include both the minister and your union leader. And, and this meeting, this uh, summit every year talks about the teacher uh, related issues, including teacher education. That is a direct kind of outcome of the OECD PISA thing and the fact that we didn't quite know, you know how, how the teacher education uh, is related to all these things that we see there. Then there's another one that this is what Stanford University and Linda Darling Hammond led uh, for several years and it's called International Teacher Policy Study. And if you're interested in taking a look at that, please do, because there's a lot of material there on the Stanford School website. Um, and also this was funded by the National Center for Education and the Economy, NCEE. Um, and they also have on their website a lot of uh, policy papers and materials. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and then all the, in, the initial teacher ed education reviews really around the world. I've been personally I've been involved in um, reviewing teacher education systems and structures in Ireland and Northern Ireland and some other places. But that's the kind of a outcome of this OECD uh, uh, review and, and survey work on education systems, many others. Then the other one is that there are a lot of myths that have appeared uh, particularly after the third cycle, when people started to travel and be more mobile, um, people call it also the education industry. You know, we have in Finland, we have a thing called Ministry of Education and Culture, 
at that time, there was some people who thought maybe we should change the name and call it the Ministry of Education and Tourism. <laughs> because there's so many people, thousands of people coming to just to see our schools and teach education places. But those are some of those myths. I'm going to show you just a kind of a snippet of three myths that are both very prevalent around the world and very, very dangerous regarding the Finnish school system. All of them are related to the teachers and what teachers do. Well, one of them is directly about the teacher education. And this is the first one. And this happened uh, about three, four years ago, I guess, or three years ago. There was a story, I don't know if you saw this, in the Independent. You know, this journalist, he even came to Finland, and he went to see the schools, and he had access to all the information. And, and this is what they published. The Philippine schools are going to do away all the subjects, and that all the schools will, in the future, or very soon, just teach the topics, the kind of a themes or projects. And I was at Harvard University that time, that spring, and I remember the reaction by the global media when they started to bombard me with the emails and phone calls and say that, how do you explain something like this, that the best education system in the world all of a sudden doesn't teach mathematics and English and Finnish language anymore? How do you do that? Why do you do that? And after about 20 responses to different media around the world, I said, I have to do something about it. So, and there was not really much done back home in Finland so I wrote this little, little piece for the Washington Post called Now this is not what's going to happen. If you want, want to hear the truth or fact, read this piece. And of course, you know, there's no country that will do the subjects away in a large scale anytime soon. It probably may happen at some point, but Finland certainly is not going to be the one that will stop teaching these subjects. The fact is that there will be probably less focus on traditional school subjects and more focus on project and problem-based learning and other things, but the subjects are not going to go away. I even got some invitations from the, the cabinet offices of the ministers somewhere around the world asking if I could come and advise the minister who is kind of inspired by this new reform in Finland and is about to make a recommendation to the parliament to abolish all the subjects in the school. <laughs> And this has been very, very harmful and dangerous. It still goes around, particularly in Down Under. You know, Australia, this has been a really persistent idea that um, you know, this is what's happening in Finland. And it's easy to build this kind of myth. Just come there and talk to people like my colleagues here, or go and see the schools, so and you quickly see that anything like this is not going to happen. Then the other one is the homework thing. A very, very harmful thing. You know, many people now think that Finland doesn't have any homework. Have you heard about that? <laughs> many people have heard about that. The Finland is a kind of an interesting place because the PISA results are sky high, but nobody does any homework. It's a very, very dangerous and harmful thing if you believe that that's, that that's true. I used to teach math and science for, for many years in, in Finnish schools. And as a math teacher, I do know that there are a very, very small number of kids who can learn mathematics well just by coming to my classes, or anybody, any other math teacher's class. You have to do homework, you have to practice, you have to think, and do your, your practice. And now by saying this, that there's no homework in Finland, it's crazy. Because it, in one way, it also kind of strengthens this myth about Finnish teachers. The Finnish teachers are so great, that they can, they can teach all the kids successfully without any homework. And then when you put this into the equation simultaneously with the fact that Finnish school days are much shorter, and there's no private tutoring, there's no shadow education in Finland, these teachers must be really, really great. <laughs> very, very harmful thing. Now, if you uh, wonder where this, where this myth comes from, there are many sources for this myth, but one very powerful was this film. And this is a film by Michael Moore. How many of you know who Michael Moore is? And Michael Moore did a film called Where to Invade Next, a few years ago. And about a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, I was, again, I was in Cambridge, and my phone rang, and it was Michael Moore. And Michael Moore said to me that, I'm going to make a film where I need your help in Finland. I said, what is your film about? And I said, I'm going to tell you, it's a little bit like Andy Hargreaves. Whenever Andy has a great idea, he says that my, my idea is so great that I cannot even tell that to you. <laughs> so Michael said, I need your help, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. So, 
So he, he made this film and I was in the world premiere in Toronto International Film Festival about two and a half years ago watching this thing. I really had kind of high expectations. I thought, I thought that somebody will finally come and make a documentary that will get things straight. And certainly because I spent a lot of time with his film crew and with him giving interviews and papers and all those things, I, I thought that you know, these guys, if anybody, they can make it correct. And I came, I walked out from the, uh, the premiere, I was furious, okay? I'm going to show you just one minute, the beginning of this Finland episode, so that you can, you can, you can see yourself what made me angry. I'm still furious to Michael. We don't actually speak to one another anymore. I said to Michael that I'm not your friend anymore. I know that Michael doesn't really care. <laughs> But that's the, way, that's the way it goes. So this is the first 90 seconds of this Finnish episode. And this looks like a movie theater, okay? So think about it. You're in the cinema now. And you came to see this film called Where Do You Make Next? And you see different episodes about different countries. And here comes the Finland part. And consider yourself not as an educator, but somebody who is just curious about international things. And then you go home from here after seeing this piece. And your husband, a wife, or friend, or somebody says, so what, what was the film like? What would you tell about Finnish education by seeing something like this? Take a look. So here's what happened. Back in the day, Finland's schools sucked on the level that ours suck on. When they tested the world's kids, both Finland and us were usually about the same, you know, somewhere down the list of nations. But Finland didn't like that. So they tried some new ideas, and in no time, Finland shot to the top of the world. Their students were number one. How did they do that? That was the one question I wanted an answer to, and I went straight to see the enemy's minister of education. Before I could say anything, she blurted out their top secret. They do not have homework. There it is. Do you use the homework you give them at school? Yes. They should have more time to be clear. Okay, and the story goes like this. You know, if the minister says that they don't have homework, it must be true. So um, don't believe that. You know, if you see if you see this film, I, I don't believe anything that Michael Moore says anymore. As it is. But you have, you have to be very very mindful because this can be very harmful and dangerous myth indeed. Okay. So you have seen that. If you want to see that? I think you can go to YouTube and just Google this Michael Moore episode. You see the whole eight nine minutes, which is kind of a nice in in many other ways, but not. Not what it is trying to tell you. So probably most of you, when you go home, you would say that you know Finland is a, it's a strange place because they, they you know they don't have homework. <laughs> and you know he, he's in, interviewing these uh, young kids that you see there in, in a moment, and all of them they say that I have five minutes and ten minutes homework and no homework at all. And, uh, of course, you know if you if you interview if you talk to 50 people, students on Monday afternoon after Sunday being the weekend there. Most of them would, in Finland, many other countries would say that I didn't do too much. Okay. That's, a, that's a kind of a myth, so don't, don't believe this, uh, this thing. So then the third one is this, the, the teacher thing, and this is a more close to um, what we are doing about here. Okay. So many of you have heard about this idea of the best and the brightest in the teaching having. Right? If you're Americans, uh, raise your hand if you're from the United States of America. So you have certainly, Lee and others, you have heard your uh, former secretary Arnie Duncan was very kind of active about you know, saying that we need to get the best people into teaching. And then there was, of course, uh, Mr. Pisa himself. I think Andres should be called Pisa. Pisa Slicer. Because he, he's really this is his, his faith. But, you know, many people are saying like this. And you, have, you hear the World Bank and the McKinsey and many others re kind of repeating the same thing. That, the, um, that we need to have, you know, the solution to chronic teacher quality or teaching quality problem is to, to recruit, try to find much smarter people into the teacher education program. This is basically what it says. And again, this was when I was, uh, I was in, in Cambridge a few years ago, and um, somebody sent me a story that was in a newspaper saying that Teach for America, you know Teach for America? Teach for America is a program, this kind of a, fast track program into teaching profession in the United States where smart people are recruited from the good colleges and universities, then they have five weeks summer course 
and that it, the, the deeds normally two or three years in very hardship communities across the United States. So in the story, somebody said that we are doing exactly what Finland is doing in the Peace of America. And for me, it was a very hard to kind of make a connection that in Finland we have a five-year master's degree for everybody that is very difficult to get in. And the Teach for America is a five-week summer course, <laughs> where it's not very difficult to get in if you want to do that. So what is a kind of a parallel between these two things, except the number five? <laughs> and this story says that just like in Finland, where you only accept 10% of your applicants into teacher education, the Teach for America also accepts 10% of the applicants. Well, they didn't say, well, this story didn't say that they deliberately take 50,000 applicants to choose 5,000 for their program every year. Okay, so I started to kind of, kind of try to explain that this is not really what is the kind of a, the, the essence of Finnish teacher education system, how many, how many students you accept there. But I, I started to kind of ask myself where this, where this idea comes from, and and then you know one thing that um, you know if you have if you are familiar with this with the Finnish system, you will see that we have for many years. In, in Finland, there has been a kind of a big number of young people who apply into primary school teacher education. That is the, my only focus here. The subject teacher education is a completely different thing. If you're interested in that, we have Yari Lavon and others here who can tell you about how, the, how that works. But there have been like a between 5,500 uh, to 8,000, a little bit more every year until 2014. And I guess it's, a, it's a pretty much the same, similar level. Uh, ever since. And the, um, the number of accepted students is about 800. We have eight universities, seven Finnish-speaking universities, and one Swedish that take all together about 800 or so. It varies a little bit. So if you do your mathematics here, you will see that it's about 10%. Okay? And then you say that Teach for America is like a Finnish program because they also take that 10% of the students. Okay, so but unlike the, the Teach for America and many others, the question was, and this was what my Harvard colleagues were asking me, that, that you, have, you still have this luxury to take the, the best and the brightest in, to become primary school teachers, so it's no wonder that you have great schools and everybody learns. And my question was, that, so how do you know how the universities are selecting these, best, these so-called best candidates? I said, but of course they do take the, the smartest people, those who have the best SAT or exam scores, because they make the best teachers. And I was kind of surprised that somebody, somebody at Harvard says something like this. Maybe that's much about Harvard. <laughs> Nobody from Stanford asked. So I said, okay, let's take a look at this. And I, I got some, uh, uh, some data from the the Finnish authorities and universities to do something like this that will show you, you know, what, ask, to answer this question of who are those who are selected in, the, um, in these university programs. And here we are looking at the University of Helsinki that is uh, represented here in this, in this symposium as well. And we have the, the cohort uh, 2014. So this is, in American terms, this is the class 2019. Okay. And what you see here is that this is a kind of a breakdown of the applicant's matriculation examination results. That is the only external standardized examination in Finland. And so if you have, if you have a student here or students here, it means that these are really good. These are really smart kids because they, they have done very well in the school living examination. If you have students here, this means that they are not really good students in school. And often they have had many other things to do than, than school. Okay. So this is where the, the best and the brightest are. And in that year, the University of Helsinki um, department had 2,300 applicants. Okay? And there were 120 seats available. It's a huge competition and a huge luxury for any university to really think about who would be those privileged people to get this seat. I don't know how would you do that if you had, and maybe you have this luxury, but most university, most of your colleagues around the world would never have this luxury. They have to take whoever is willing to come. Or then, then you have just a very little competition there. But this university and most Finnish universities have this luxury of really thinking about who to take. Okay? And now, of course, having this big pool of candidates, it would be easy to take 100% of them from here, right? It's a, it's a big enough pool to say that all of these 120 kids would be the best and the brightest. 
and then I would resign. I would say, that, okay, you're right, and this is, um, this is not a kind of something that anybody has. But this is what the distribution of the, the cognitive academic talent looked like three years ago, or four years ago. Which means that there's only one quarter of those kids are so-called best and the brightest, if you accept that, that term, and another quarter of the accepted students are from the bottom half of this academic spectrum. And of course, if you see if this is true, and you see something like this, then the question is that why the hell the university or department is interested in these kids? Who are those? Why do you do that? This is what I hear all the time when people kind of look at this type of thing. Why do you do that? What, why so many? What do you think is the answer to this? The finished delegation, you have to decide. Them. What's that? In what sense diversity? It may be there, but you, you know, many of these many of these students here, they already have some background working with children, or working at the school, or they, they may be uh, may have background in sports or arts, music, something that proves those people who are in charge of selecting, choosing who to take, makes them to say that you know this is a really good good young person. He's been a basketball coach for many years to kids. And if he or she can kind of convince the others that, you know, I'm, I'm, as a coach, I know how to make kids do things that they don't like. That's exactly what the teachers are doing often. I have to figure out you know, how to make kids run in the rain if it happens to be in a coaching program. Okay? So that's the kind of a thing um, that we do. And so most of the selected, at least in this case, we're just the average students. You know, I'm one of those, I applied twice to be a student in the primary school kids education program when after I left high school. And I failed twice. So I ended up teaching at Harvard University and <laughs> Harvard University of New South Wales instead. Okay. Are you with me? It's, it's very interesting, right? It's a myth. So you know the, the thing is that we really have to understand what we're talking about. And if you have a luxury to choose students, don't say that we do what Finland is doing, and take the best and the prizes, but if you really want to do what Finland is doing, go and study you know, how these universities really select these students uh, in a different way. This is the story of my niece. You know, all of those here, if you don't believe that I'm serious, let me tell you a true story. This is my niece, who was a top student in her class. She was among the best students when she was graduating high school, after secondary school in Finland. And one day in the spring, when she was uh, going to the examination, he said, Uncle, I need your advice. I have decided to become a primary school teacher. What should I do? And I said, Vera, you don't need to worry about this, because you're exactly the kind of a candidate that the University of Helsinki or any school in Finland would love to have. You're good in school, you love children, you do sports and music, and you have three little sisters and brothers, you know how to deal with those things. Just be there. And don't try to pretend to be anybody who you are. A few months later, you know, she was in an entrance examination at the University of Helsinki again, and she called me and she was desperately crying. And she said, I just got a letter that they reject me. Okay? And in any other country, she would be a kind of a, you know, she would be taken from home by limo to the School of Education every day just to make sure that she would not go to law or business. And I said, so what was the, um, what do you think happened there? And, you know, there are, th that time, they, they were, we still have a kind of a two-phase thing. Maybe my colleagues can, can tell later how this is about to change, but we still have this kind of a two-phase selection to primary school teacher education, where everybody first takes the written exam. It's a kind of a universal nationwide exam that every, anybody who wants to get to become a teacher has to sit. And it's not just any, any exam, it's a quite demanding kind of a thing that you have to understand what you read and be able to construct kind of answers that sh should somehow illustrate or re represent your understanding, early understanding of education. Okay? So she said, that I passed that one because I'm good in school. I know how to read and learn things quickly. Okay? So then she, was, uh, she said, I went to the second part. And in the second part, that time when she went there, there was a kind of an application demonstration test where she said that I was with four other students, applicants, and we had to plan something and then, you know, act it out to the panel. 
And she said, that worked very well, because you know, I, I know how to work with the young people and so on. And I knew that there was something that she didn't do quite well in the interview. So all, all of these candidates went to the individual interview, and I said, so what, what happened there? And she said that maybe the, the most difficult question was when the, one of the panelists said, that, so why don't you there? Why don't you, why don't you become a teacher? Because with your grades and your diploma, you could, could go to study law or business or medicine, whatever you want. Why education? Why teach? And she said, that I didn't quite think about that. And the only thing that came to my mind at that point was that, because my uncle is a teacher. <laughs> and I said, that's the only thing you said? And she said, no, no. I said that my grandfather was a teacher. <laughs> and my mother was a teacher for a while. And there were a lot of teachers in the family, so she said that, I think it's a, teaching is a kind of a family business. And that was only enough. If I had been there in the panel interviewing her, I would do exactly the same thing. Where are you on a thread? You don't understand where you're getting into. So she asked me, that, so what should I do? Because I really want to be a teacher. I said, go and teach in the school for a while and see how it is. If it's really what you want to do, apply again and talk about those things that you experienced. This is exactly what she did. She got in and graduated. And now she's one of those young people in Finland who's a teacher for life. She will never leave. This is her kind of moral commitment to improve lives of uh, young people and communities in Finland. So that's the kind of thing. And now I thought I'll, I'll break just for a minute before I close this thing. And I'm going to give you a test. This, this test is not necessarily in a Finland's uh, entrance examination to become a primary school teacher. But this is just a good one for you, okay? Are you ready for this? So this is a very simple thing. What you need to do, this is mathematics, because mathematics is very important, right? <laughs> so what you need to do when you see a number appearing here, you just have to shout out that number as loudly as you can. Just like you were singing. When you see another number appearing, you add that number into the previous one. And when you see the third number appearing, you add that number to the previous one, okay? And in about 3.15, we should be done. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Sure? Let's see. But you have to be loud, just like you were supporting your basketball or football team. One, two, three, let's go. Is this, is this a lecture hall or is this a chapel? This is not the chapel this time. It's a lecture hall. I want, when I see noise, I want to hear noise a lot. Okay? Are you with me? Yes! Okay, one, two, three, let's go. Louder! Education and teachers, 
you see there's China, Singapore, uh, Finland, Australia, Canada case studies. Very useful press information about where we stand with those things. So let me just close by you know close this with this kind of a scheme of the what some people call education, teacher education ecosystem uh, that we have in Finland and that many people are thinking about right now. It's a very simple scheme. There's nothing new for many of you. But what the, what the mistake is with, with uh, Finnish teacher education by many is that they kind of cherry pick some of those things. Like I have heard many people saying that Finland has a master's degree based teacher education. So let's do the same that Finland is doing. Or they say that this master's degree based thing is including research. So let's have a little bit of research there. And it's like Finland. Like our, our uh, sisters and brothers now in Norway and Sweden tend to be thinking like this. So let's just add one more year to the current teacher education program so it looks like Finland. And it's not, it's not easy, like, easy like this. So if you look at the teacher education, um, what, you know, what the kind of a main structure, and there are four elements in my country. One is the, of course, the research-based degree at the university. This is what everybody has to do. There's no Teach for Finland. There's no fast-track program to become a teacher. Everybody, every teacher has to do this, regardless of what level of system you are teaching. And the research requirement, the rigor, is the same as in any other faculty or field of education, uh, field of science or academia in the university. Then the other one is the, the, the which is most often ignored, is that we have in Finnish universities, there's a kind of a unit or department for teacher education. Most universities don't have that. I don't know how it's here in Hong Kong, but most universities that do teacher education do not have this. The teacher, it's a kind of a program. In many cases where I have visited these uh, universities, they have an office, they have a coordinator for teacher education. But there's not a department or unit that has a structure like any other department or unit within the university with the leadership, the funding, with the researchers, and the way of working just like ad academic units work. And that's it's a very, very important part of the, uh, part of the system. How many, how many staff are in the Helsinki Teacher Education Department? Jari used to be the director. 300 people working there. Huge. Much more than three coordinators who are coordinating you know, these programs. Then the faculty interlinkages uh, is often ignored and undermined as a kind of an important part. This means that the, the Department of Teacher Education that is in the School of Education, the Faculty of Education, has a very close integral relationships with the other faculties that train subject teachers, like sciences or humanities or others. And, and these, these faculties often also has a responsibility to educate teachers, sub subject teachers. It's a very, very unique type of thing and really critical element of this ecosystem in Finland. And then, of course, the, the clinical teacher training schools that every university that is preparing teachers has. And I'm going to show you, I know that I'm, I'm short of time, but I'm going to show you a little clip, just a couple of minutes, again from the international teacher policy study that I showed done in Stanford. You can, you can see this whole film in NCEE or Stanford School website. But this will show you a little bit about you know what this kind of a clinical training, what does it look like? So you, you will hear professor, teacher, and students and children speaking in this two minute clip. You wanna see this? Because this is very interesting to put some kind of flesh around this word. But let's take a look at it. It's one unit of University of Helsinki. And as such, it is the place that houses teacher training or future teachers who study at the University of Helsinki also do their practice here. Clinical practical training for the primary school teachers is about 50 to 20 percent out of the entire five-year degree. I'm doing this practice with my fellow student, Rina, and we do everything together. We are now teaching the second grades, and they are doing newspaper. There is a pair of students and a supervising teacher. Some of them have not taught 
anything in their lives, and they have their memories from their own school time. Here they meet, maybe for the first time, the pupils. I think they uh, begin to realize how important it is to know every single one of them, and to know their uh, capabilities, and how each pupil learns. Finland can rely so much on kind of a teacher and schoolmate assessment yes, and tests. <laughs> because of the teachers, most of the teachers know their pupils and students very well. During the lesson I make notes and then I tell them what I saw and what I heard. <laughs> I think my main duty is, as I do with the children, to empower them, to help them find out where they are good. Together, our task is to try to conceptualize the things what happens happened during the lessons and combine theory and practice. So, so that's, that's a little piece. Uh, the, whole, the entire thing is about 15 minutes. Again, if you want to go online, you can you can you can watch the whole uh, whole thing. Now, let me summarize. Here. I'm going to close now and um, and leave you with the, um, some final thoughts. Now, the question that many people around the world are facing is: that Should we teach or not to teach? You know, and and often people ask that. So how do we get how do we get more young people inspired and interested in teaching? I I guess that this is something that most of you are thinking about. Okay. And um, now, again, we need to get these facts and myths right. We, we need to stay away from the myths and understand how things really are. And so my kind of formula respond to any minister or anybody who is like at the policy or political level interested in doing something that seems to be coming from the good practice, not only in Finland, but you know, around the world that we know what would make young people choose, think about teaching as a, as a career. One is, one is the one that, that we really need to focus on putting the quality control at entry. It doesn't make any sense to take everybody in and then build a very expensive systems to control quality at the graduation or even worse, when the teachers are already in the school. But many countries seem to be doing nowadays. They have to be teacher evaluation systems and all sorts of things to make sure that every single teacher is doing things right. In Finland, we don't need to do that because we are absolutely clear up front before they even start their studies that then most of these students will be good teachers. It's a, it's a very, very good policy if you have a luxury to do that. Then the degrees have to be competitive. It doesn't make any sense to set kind of a compromise with the quality of the academic degrees for teachers. Say that because you're only going to be a primary school teacher, you can get a little bit easier here. You know, these young people who are looking for a career and their lives nowadays, they have ambitions. They want to be like lawyers and doctors and others. And that's why we need to be sure that all these things that they, we ask them to do compare fairly and honestly with what they do. What they would do, they go to business or law or medicine or something like this. We can do that if we want to do that. And, and, and many young people are really giving value to that. Then we have to make sure that the schools, the teachers have professional autonomy in the school when they graduate. Again, it doesn't make any sense to train them well and keep all these programs if they go to a workplace where somebody else is asking them what to do and telling, controlling them all the time. That's when, when you hear the, the, the Billy story often saying that we trust our teachers and they have a lot of freedom and autonomy to do these things. Because that's what they teachers want to do. It's a little bit what Lee was uh, speaking about this morning, about the teaching being a profession. And then this is very important. That the teachers, young people, if they, if, if they experience that they have a high probability to get employed after graduation, it makes a big difference. Many countries, Australia as a whole, is a good example of the place where there's a huge surplus of teachers coming from, from teacher education, at least in the New South Wales. New, New, South, Wales is, okay, New South Wales is a good example. But there are a lot of teachers graduating who will never find a job because there's so many of them. Uh, you know, teacher education is a cash cow. It was, should never be used by universities to just to make money. That's a wrong thing to, it's, it does a very bad things for our profession. So that's, that's a thing that if you have, if you, if you can make young people feel that if I get into the program, I study hard, I graduate, and I'll find a job. That's a formula for having more people 
get in there. And this is my plan. I was thinking about how, how should I leave this, this uh, floor now? And I could figure out anything better to do. But you know, at the time of crisis, I, I would call it that we have a crisis in not only education, but particularly within the teaching profession. We have a crisis in, around the world that it's harder to get the young people to teaching. We have more teachers leaving their professions than ever before. Uh, we have more distrust on teachers professionally than ever before. And the image of being a teacher is lower than it has been for a long time. So if this is not a crisis, tell me what is. Okay? The good news is that there are people like Sir Ridley Scott. You know Sir Ridley Scott? He's a famous filmmaker made the Alien and Thelma and Louise and you know, all those wonderful things in the TV and cinema. And he went to accept the PAFTA Award that is a kind of a uh, British Academy of Film and Arts. So he, he was uh, inducted as a fellow into this academy. And when you go and take this, uh, this award, you have about seven minutes to say something. And the beautiful thing that he did two weeks ago in London was that he spoke seven minutes about education, about teachers. And very rare that anybody would do that. And I'm going to just play you half a minute of this, his speech. It's not a great speech. He said, I'm not a good speaker because I, I can't remember anything. I have to kind of read them all the time. It doesn't matter. But what he's saying is hopeful. And again, Lee was talking about hope, that we need to have hope. I hope that you have had humor, humility, humanity, and now a little bit hope in this talk. Um, because I couldn't do it better than Richard Scott. I'm going to ask him to do that. And just listen to this. He's not saying that the teachers can do everything. He's talking about teaching. And we all know that teaching and teachers is a, is a different, different thing. But listen to this. Audience. The college was a revelation. It's weirdly dressed students expressing their individualism. Passionate teachers who are genuinely interested in the students. Not just tolerating, but actually engaging with them. A world apart from my schooling until then. It's extraordinary what an enthusiastic teacher can do. Drawing the student out igniting independence and encouraging the design of your own future rather than waiting for something to happen. Teaching is the most important of all professions. Sort that out and social problems will get sorted out. Thank you very much. Have a great symposium. Thank you.